is going to talk about uh, uh, the uh, challenges of uh, doing remote applications in this uh, environment, which raises uh, is, uh, a method for uh, remote applications in challenging environments. So, um, uh, I think we can just uh, welcome Shai and thank you for coming here and we can talk about what he's doing. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so if I don't keep the microphone close to my face, to tell me different hand motions. Um, and feel free to ask questions as I go along. Um, just pick a hand up or just shout them out. Um, so there's going to be a lot of videos. So we to talk over them and they'll loop around. Um, so, a oh, quick introduction about myself. Hello, I'm Guy Burrows, um, the guy. I work at RACE, which is part of the UK Atomic Energy Authority, which is over in Cullen, on, uh, with the Cullen Centre for Fusion Energy. Um, I am part of the cybernetics group there. So, RACE, let's jump in, is right up here in the corner of our site, so this is, used to be HMS Hornbill, um, the UK government set it up to research for nuclear uh, fusion, so we have fusion devices here, but we have our robotics arm up here, and it's slowly spreading out in different fields. There are about uh, 180 of us, um, 160 it says here, but there's about 180 of us, full-time engineers, um, with electronic engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, uh, systems engineers, software engineers, um, and we do a variety of different projects. So I'm personally on my Eurofusion Engineering grant, um, so I'm a fellow doing a research project into deep reinforcement learning for uh, fusion environments, so I'll discuss that briefly uh, as we go along. But I'm also involved, uh, lead engineer on a few decommissioning projects involved for Setterfield um, and VR projects for other applications, and uh, I dabble in virtualization for the site as well, so we're upgrading the servers. Um, so this talk isn't just going to be about what I'm doing, I'm not going to get into depth of mathematics of the systems either, it's going to be a sort of a flying tour of um, the, the problems in remote applications and challenging environments, and some of the solutions as we see them. So just give a little bit more background. Um, Jump in. So, fusion. So, uh, fusion we see as being the next big goal um, for most governments, really. <laughs> so, we could get to a very clean source of energy, renewable, um, very rapidly. So, in 1997, on the jet site over in Cullen, we proved that you could get to a viable energy source with up a Q above one or more energy out than you put in. Um, so the way that you do this is by firing your deuterium at your tritium. So here you can see various <laughs> deuteriums flying around. And they wallop into each other very hard. I did do a physics degree by, by the way of my master, so I should be able to describe this better, but this will do. Um, <laughs> and then you get the helium neutron off. We use the neutrons to fly off into the outside. This is your radiation, so this is your challenging environment. Um, and this loads into the walls, and this damages the walls. Um, just to give a little bit more context as well, right, let's keep going while we're looking at this video. What the neutrons do is obviously shift the outer wall um, like this, so it actually starts degrading your metal. Also, when you go in there, um, as these things start to degrade down again as well, they produce neutrons, so um, there is background radiation, uh, a higher amount of radiation coming off them for around about five years. So when we say radioactive, it's not like your nuclear challenges, it's uh, much, much lower. So the other thing that we're getting is um, this purple bit that you're seeing here is actually the coolest part of the plasma. This is about 40,000 degrees Kelvin, so it's uh, great, it doesn't really matter with this temperature. The bit in the center that you're seeing is dark, and that's 150 million degrees Celsius, so 10 times the center of the sun. Pretty toasty. Um, the problem with that is that um, 
we have to come up with the materials that can survive occasional impacts with 40,000 degrees, just slight skids. So we have a material research facility looking into that. The other half, challenge number four, is getting all the tritium. Tritium is pretty expensive. It's all up in Canada and the Great Lakes for some reason. Um, and we're running out of it pretty quickly. I think we actually hold around about 30% um, of it on the jet site at the moment, of the purified um, tritium. Um, is that in the world? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah. I think we might have released some again, actually. So, but we have a, pro a tritium processing plant and a detritiation plant, and they're quite unique. But basically, once you have that UV in, you can come up with tritiation black, um, breeding blankets, so part of the reaction, you get your neutrons flying out, and they bounce into the outside of the wall, and that'll actually cause the reaction to breed more tritium. Um, the other half of it is, like I'm saying, it's very warm and very magnetic. We have beryllium on the tiles, so beryllium oxide, similar to asbestos in some degrees, um, and we have to use robots. Since, so since 1997, I'll go on to the next slide, which starts talking about that more, um, we have robotically maintained uh, jet. So pretty much everything that happens in jet, so this is the outside of the building, inside, so you can see it's a very complex device. We send these two robot arms in, so these are 12 and a half meters long now, you can start seeing. We start off very simple, people in baker's suits, being very clean, you can see we get burn, now we're getting a bit more toxic, we have to actually send people into rubber suits as we do our first tritium experiments. And then after 1997, when we did deuterium tritium, it's all robotically maintained, and you can see pretty much it's a thesis ship sort of situation where we replace everything out. Um, so, yeah. Talk about it a bit more in a moment because these are flying by. Um, we have two booms that go inside the vessel, and on the end of one of them is a toolbox so we can bring stuff in. On the other side, we have our master slave device. Um, so, this is mascot. It's not our original design, but we have upgraded it over the years. It was a design in the 1950s, um, and so there's some brilliant footage from the World's Fair of it. Um, making cups of tea for very impressed visitors in black and white. And it works exactly the same. Um, so the level of haptics that we get of this thing, so there's a, hopefully a video will come from it, when the user, about 100 meters away, moves his robot arm, the robot arm on the end of the other end, swipes down and does exactly what he does, and that allows him to feel, on a surface like this, sellotape or sticky tape against the edge of the surface. And that's the level of haptics that you require if you're going to be doing every task that a human was possibly doing in this environment. So they do hoovering, waxing, cleaning, um, welding, um, placing the tiles with micrometer accuracy. So you can see this is Tim, um, I think, operated in 2011, with our master device, our slave device, and rather unfortunate for naming, and every single item being placed. Um, so these breeds are fairly expensive as well, so they're about 40k. So we try not to damage them too much. Uh, physicists get angry. But we, you can see he's using um, specialist screwdrivers to be able to wheel this in. Um, and because we have very limited camera views, the first thing you do is you go in, you install cameras, you install your lights. But you generally have to use a lot of VR. So we've had VR since about 1991. Um, in that sense, to be able to show us where the elbows are. So here we go, you can see. Um, this was filmed about three months ago. So, robot curve turns in. This is about um, just enough for my shoulders to fit through, for the holes that they sort of fit through. Through they go. Um, <coughs> they only have one hole to go in through. So, we have two holes. Um, the rest, so, we have a shutdown period essentially. So, at the moment, um, they're just going back into operation. So, for the next two years, there's going to be pulses every 20 minutes for 16 hours a day. Um, a pulse lasts about somewhere, depending on the experiment, from seven seconds to maybe a bit longer. Um, what long does it take to cool down once you have a pattern? Is it easy? Have you turned it off for Half a second. Yeah, so the amount of fuel that's in the fusion reaction is about half a postage stamp and weight. Um, as soon as you turn it off, you just watch the graph show. Because there's, there's no actual fuel and there's no heating. The splatter that you occasionally get, so we do get vents, and there we go. So you can see, you get this outer wall, um, we get heat flux coming down, and we feed it out through the diverter. This is just where the excess fuel goes. 
we actually learn that very quickly on that you need to funnel out your waste materials or it gets in the way. Um, but let's keep going. Because um, I'll get more videos. So, and just so, stupid curiosity. If it's so hot in there, how do you get the camera shots from what's going on in there? Behind a very small window. So we keep it confined, obviously. So in the centre, um, it's 150 million. But because we're using magnetic confinement, out here, it, it shouldn't really get above sort of 12 degrees. Really? So yeah. the heat change is actually a step change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so there's a, there's a physical boundary on the plasma. Um, we do have um, events that we call upsets or deviations. Um, essentially, the idea is that um, yeah, it's rather uh, euphemistic. So it's literally keeping, plasma, uh, keeping lightning in a bottle. And lightning does not like being in that bottle. It's a very unstable uh, you know, equation. So lightest moments, you'll see a ripple, and then all the plasma will just slam itself into a wall. And so for that moment, there will be a small amount of heat transfer, but most of the time, there's hardly any heat transfer to the outside. We have got delicate equipment on just the other side of all these walls, so there are shielding walls that you can just see if we can get that to bed again. As you can see here, so we have yeah, um, coils up under here. These are ICRH, so this is essentially a microwave radiator shooting in heat into the plasma. Um, so yeah, we, the magnetic environment means that we actually keep it all basically in the center. We don't have much fuel to waste smooshing it around. Um, so yeah, you can see what's kind of going on with the robots. So with this robot, let's go on to the next one. We can see we've had eight shutdown programs. It's about two million different operations this robot has performed. It, keep, it takes us around about 30 people to keep this maintained full time. So. Um, How much data does it generate? Barely any. It's really disappointing from a machine learning point of view. So this was <laughs> designed and built in the 90s, 80s. Um, they weren't worried about keeping data. They wanted to throw it away. It's a little bit like that with Jet Full Stop. There's a lot of um, data that's just sort of processed very, very quickly, and then all the raw data is kind of gone because we don't, we never thought we'd need it. And is there another plan to change that to? We are slowly updating that. So one of the things we did for Jet before this shut down is that we we capture all the telemetry coming off it, which was never been done before, um, so that we can start thinking about. Um, well, I'll get through a bit more. So this is our robot. You can see praying mantis, and we've got a camera. Camera down here, camera here. There's a camera on each joint. Um, to try and be non too high tech, these are just poseable joints that you just sort of grab the other arm and just move around. Um, robotics breaks, so we try and minimize the amount of robots we actually use. Even though we really, really like robots and want to put much as possible. Oh, there's the other camera on. Um, other things we've got like plug and, plug and play things here, so you can take out this third arm that just has a gripper in it, you can put winches in. This is about as versatile and close to a human as we think is out there from a robotic system at the moment. Robot might be a bit of a strong word, it's teleoperation. There is no intelligence in this system at all. There's a PD loop, maybe, um, that's about it. On the other end, similar idea, we actually do have two of those devices, the two mascots, but we can plug onto this side instead of the toolbox in case the other one breaks and we have to go cut it out. Um, but we try not to do that too often. I don't think we're going to have to even try it. Other things that are happening is that these are being constantly swapped out. There's lifts in the floor that go into the basement, but also you can see um, all of these individual components are being loaded up and placed in the correct location so that when we are actually going into the machine, we're running a 60 hour a day, um, we can do this as quickly as possible. So it's about a quarter of a million pounds a day to run this facility. So every minute really counts, um, just because we have physicists waiting around, getting angry at us, not letting them play with their toy. So that entire area considers to be contaminated? Uh, yeah. yeah, so the contamination um, at the moment, there's no radiation. Uh, we're just going into a DT phase. So this is all for beryllium. So this is um, for beryllium. So beryllium gets into your lungs of about a quarter of the people. It's a bit like asbestosis beryllium. 
worth noting there's only ever been four cases in the history of anything, not just here, but in the world. But you still don't want people getting it. Apparently, when um, the head of the remote handling operations group started, um, he was actually just using a band saw to cut the brilliant up without any few masks. But you know, progress. <laughs> Um, in that time, in the 35,000, we've come up with a lot of mechanical gizmos that make this easier. Um, also, what um, well, you can see from the control room pictures, you can't see much. Um, we have five operators in there at all times. Uh, one for each boom, so the two long arm things. Um, one on the mascot. One person just running the cameras, so there's about 30 cameras once you're all in and going. So you actually need someone just running them to help the actual mascot operator control where it goes. Interesting thing about a mascot operator, it takes around about 100 hours before you're deemed to be allowed to use it. It takes 1,000 hours, 2,000 hours of pure training before you're deemed competent for some tasks. And you have to then prove yourself to get better and better. Although, the trainers say that they can tell within about the first two minutes of you ever touching the machine if you'll ever get it. So some of the strange things that you'll be witnessing in uh, these operations is that the robot will be upside down and you'll be working on some tooling on the roof, doing some welding, and you're still sat like this in a chair. So if you let go of something, you'll just fly off in a random direction. And gravity doesn't really match. You're working on 2D images because they don't like using 3D headsets because it's tiring for their eyes. So it's a really complex geometric task So we really struggle to find people capable of doing this. Um, yeah, so that's another thing that, as we go forward, we're trying to alleviate. Operations management. So um, I think we actually got there first, fortunately, in our field. So obviously in um, medical and flight, they realized that checklists what you do if you want to reduce errors. So everything that we do in the reactor goes through the operations management system or the operations database system. So we go through a scheme of proving it in CAD and simulation, or paper. Then we have a one-to-one -one mock up of the entire vessel that we test it in 15 times. And then we have a full orchestrated view of has this happened? Yes, go to the next step, and follow it, follow it through. And if you deviate from there at all, you just have to stop and um, work out how to get back from your deviation. Right. So, let's so let's jump back to race now for a second. So race is the um, was the jet remote handling group in 2015. Um, the UK government realised that um, it probably shouldn't be just giving small department of robotics, endless money, and not letting anyone know about it. Probably should actually try and utilize some of this knowledge and technology out in the rest of the UK industry. So we were formed into RACE to be a sort of uh, flagship and national laboratory helping UK industry in robotics and challenging environments. So that's not just fusion. Fusion is about 50% of our business. It's also into decommissioning. Nuclear, obviously, is very linked. But then into space, oil, gas and mining, deep sea rigs, anywhere where um, we'd rather humans didn't go and robots did go. So, as I was saying before, UKA as a whole, the primary mission is fusion. Um, and we are currently leading the sort of primary pre-concept design for demo. And demo is something that should be plugged in by 2044 into the national grid <coughs> of whichever country gets lucky enough to get win the bid to plug it in first um, for fusion power. We do believe <coughs> that we have all the technologies available to us now to achieve that, but building billion, wow, trillion dollar international projects take that time. Hello? But do you actually produce some power? Yeah, so uh, in 1997, APJET, even though it's an experimental reactor, we produced 0.7 of what we put in. However, as you can see, the elements that, so here you go, in the pictures, the elements that actually take the energy and produce it only take up about 10% of the space. So if we just jammed it full of this into a diagnostics equipment, it would have worked. There's the next step as well of you can scale these things up. So it's a square rule. So the bigger the diameter, the more energy you get out of it by a square. Hence why 
it is unbelievably huge. And I'll try and move on to the next slide now. So what's stopping nuclear fusion from reality is just a billion dollars? Trillion dollars probably, yeah. Or probably less than that if it wasn't international because everyone has their part of it. It's really hard trying to do engineering with you know, over Skype. You try Discord. <laughs> yeah, so there is definitely there are big issues. So kilograms per hour, that's a lethal dose in what point two seconds or something. So it's Ark of the Covenant, Indiana Jones sort of stuff. Um, but the good thing about fusion compared to nuclear, you leave that in a box for about five years, all of that's gone and you can just recycle thing, these things straight into normal, back into normal factories or even which processed food cans. Which particular radiation is it? Gamma. Okay. Yeah, well it's neutron and gamma, but it's slightly different for both, and the neutrons do something different. Other issues, um, right, just keep moving. So here you go, you can see the two kilograms, and it drops off pretty quickly, but it's just where the plasma is, essentially. It does mean that if you are going to do anything to this part of the machine, it will have to be robots, and it'll have to be radiation hard robots. Um, so, current limit to sort of cameras, three kilograms an hour, so your camera's going to die in about an hour and a half. Not very useful. Um, so, next steps are looking at rad hard sensors, um, but you can do other things as well by just moving your sensors just slightly further away, having a really good lens. So, talking about jet, the next step is ITER. ITER is being built in Canarache, South France. Pretty much paradise um, at the moment. They're halfway through, in theory. So this is the pit. Um, they have a building to the side where they're doing a lot of experimental production. But this is where the fusion reactor go. To give you some scale, what we have is human being, Jen. So you can kind of walk around in here. Um, and that's why they were pictures of people. Eater, pretty big, um, very, very similar, but realistically the stuff around the outside, seven times more complex. Step up again, you'll notice that actually the, the D shape of the torus where the plasma goes, basically about the same size. Um, it's all the stuff around the outside that's going to make it complicated. Is that what they're building currently on the right? So this one, the one they're building currently, this is what we're designing currently. So we're trying to offset this. It's, 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 a, it's a staged approach. So obviously, we're going to learn what needs to be done for Inita to build this thing. Also, we kind of need this now. You have, um, you have projected launch date or activation date. Yeah, we do. It does slide around. <laughs> <laughs> Is it mainly <laughs> in the future? <laughs> uh, 2050? 2045? Yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah. And the tech tree of the game, we're getting close to it. Um, <laughs> the question is, where is here in the UK? So, we, we are trying to win it as a UK government. We believe that we have the technical capabilities on our side to achieve this. We have the technology. We have the technology, we have the people. Um, but it's an international project with big players getting involved. So, the people involved in this project are everyone involved. So, Eurofusion. Um, England, if we're still in Eurofusion by the end of this talk. Um, <laughs> China, America, Korea, um, Saudi Arabia, Russia. Um, so anyone who wants lights, energy, and having lights on. What um, is the output of something that large? Um, it's in the gigawatts sort of range. So a lot. You, you wouldn't need <laughs> <that>. many. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't need many of them to power a country. Oh wow! But to find many. <laughs> um, well, it, it, you would still you wouldn't rely on it fully. Um, so you would still use wind and hydroelectric and other things in your energy portfolio. This would take up a large proportion, um, about fifty percent, and you'd be depending on the size of your country. Some of the problems that we're looking at for ITER. Um, is this complexity thing that I was talking about. So, this is going to play. These are sort of the CAD designs that you're looking at at the moment. So this is a diagnostics pipe, this is a laser guide tube. 
Uh, there's some rail systems to be able to run things around. So this whole area will be robotically maintained. Come on, hey, I'll see. Next slide. Um, and then you start thinking about, right, we need to run cables to every bit, put that in. And you go, oh, wait a sec. We need all the diagnostics equipment. And now I've run out of room to put my robots anywhere. It's really annoying. Um, so these are the sort of issues is that this is a project on the scale bigger than pretty much anything else we've ever done before. Um, and things get exponentially harder the more things you put in. So every one of these, like every seventh element in here is probably more complicated than what we built at Jet. Um, so to give you some scale, that building is slightly bigger than Buckingham Palace. Um, this back here is pretty much all nuclear, very concrete, no human entry. And then back here is the nuclear reactor that I was talking about. Um, so all of this will be robotically maintained. It's sort of about a kilometer by a kilometer and a half this way. Um, so it needs lots of robots. Um, so yeah. Current design is being routine in vessel operation for refueling maintenance. So all of those elements on the outside will need to be replaced every five years or so just to sort of deal with the wear and tear. So that will mean going inside. So for demo, this means using you know, uh, a series of about 15 robots. So this is for four, but that's just because the animation gets difficult. There's 16 ports on the outside of this vessel. So this is our bio shield, the concrete where no radiation exposures. So you have to take those out. Then once the animation moves on, they all get fed away. So all of this area up here as well is vaguely contaminated. It's probably safe enough to send a human once in a while, but we really don't want to send humans anywhere into the special account. Then we're going inside the vacuum vessel behind the magnetic coil that you can see here. So these are just big, those will be the largest semiconductors in the uh, superconductors in the world. And then behind these blankets. Um, these blankets are really hard to get to because there's pipe work here all the way down. So we'll have to send robots in to, on four point cranes to then start taking it away. Um, so these are pretty concept designs. These have changed since this video. I know there's a lot of mad things going on here, but these are still things that we're working out essentially. They're sort of demonstrating the sort of level of complexity that we're going to have to challenge with. So you can see there's a large amount of. Um, Pipe work, more shielding, <laughs> more diagnostics plugs. Um, let's jump through this because it's getting crazy. Really the consideration being given to how long the maintenance takes? Yeah, so that's the primary um, driver at the moment. So this facility is about, uh, I can't remember what the number is, 2.5 million a day for downtime. If your electricity is going to be cheap, cheaper than Hinkley Point C, you're going to want to. Um, run this pretty, you, you're, you're really trying to minimize it. So having this extremely long period of time if you're doing it with humans in the loop doing tele operations becomes very, very challenging. Uh, what I'm doing. Wasn't uh, Germany, was, are you mentioning Germany building a fusion reactor? So they have the Wendelstein W1. Um, this is a Eurofusion project primarily, um, so that's based in Gauchi. Um, which is just down the road from Wendelstein is going. Um, instead, for Wendelstein, instead of a torus reactor, they've gone for a different design which allows the plasma to take more natural routes so they don't have instabilities. But it is much harder to build because it is such a wiggly wobbly shape. Um, and see, so you can see these blankets being come out. And I'll come back to these in a little while again. That's 15, 18 meters long. The clearance here was a centimeter. It's pretty tight. And we need to do that because the magnets need to be in exactly the right place so the physics doesn't work. Um, so yeah, and you can see slightly glitchy animations. There's going to be hundreds of robots then having to deal with these things after they um, come out of the machine to be processed, to be put away for 10 years so they'll be recyclable and safe. We have learned from our mistakes in the nuclear industry. You have to clean up as you go along. And if we're going to be eco-friendly and save the world with this power, we can have to be efficient about it. Okay. So I'm going to move vaguely off fusion for the moment and move on to some of the other ideas. Um, so as 
as I was saying, if we're going to manage that all in an effective time, we're going to need to do it quickly. Humans um, are generally quite slow and very expensive and a bit dangerous at times. Um, so autonomous systems is kind of the place where we need to go. Um, it's also very hard to train humans to do what we want to. Yeah. Um, I quite like these videos. Okay. <laughs> so you can see we're, we're actually getting really close, and a lot of this is coming from the deep reinforcement world. Um, but there are many, many more traditional operations that get us closer. So you can see, even sort of 2017, they were looking at funny. This is for more mimics, so this is more about animation style. But you can actually see that the the style of um, interaction with a physics engine here. It's incredible for a 36 joint robot, and you can get them to do multiple objects. You can start um, getting them to jump over things, number things. You can get them to do backflips. You can start firing blocks at them. They will bust a noise. So that's the thing that we've always struggled with with robotics in the real world: is that um, software is very good at prescribed um, areas. Once you start getting them to jump over. Sort of weird blocks, or trying to transfer into areas where the real world interacts with them. Your sensors are noisy. You've got time delays. Um, uncertainty is very hard to characterise. This is where machine learning is really taking um, leaps and bounds, like that little robot, um, to be able to fix this. Um, so you can get them to do. You know. right. so that just gives you some of the context of some things that are happening. There we go. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. Um, we're obviously applying these are very simple things, so object recognition within the plant, so even though these are incredibly similar objects, you can identify <coughs> the vertebrae sections, um, or sections, you can identify anomalies in your field, so at the moment we do a two-week um, photogrammetry survey, and we take a photo of every tile to see if it's got an melt on it, so this is a small amount of green that's sort of slashed onto the surface. Um, very easy even with traditional um, computer vision techniques to spot those, but with blind AI, then it's a project that we look at to spot that sort of thing. Um, next task is also controlling huge, huge robots. So we can talk about that in a minute. Um, again, if you're getting noisy images coming from radiation damage hitting your CCD, it can be random. You can get your your networks, your generative adversarial networks, just understand what's going on in the image, understand that this is a tile, probably should have a green dot on it. And so on. And you might not want to use that for safety, but for being able to see what's going on, it's very clear. Um, and this runs in real time, you can run a video. Um, so it's a piece of work I did a couple of years ago. Beyond that, you can start then getting them to do handling tasks, so picking and stacking blocks. Um, you can run this all in simulation by tomorrow. I hope I was hoping to get video you, but by tomorrow I'll have it running on hardware doing a similar task, um, just stacking blocks and putting them into holes. Benefit of obviously running in simulation, you can run it five million times, no hurry. Um, doing it in hardware is very difficult. One of the nice things about this deep reinforcement learning is that you can make it robust to that changeover, so you can do a one-shot transfer, they call it, where you fiddle with the parameters of your simulation, so the colour of the robot arm, so if the lighting changes is different, you can change gravity just a little bit, or over like a Gaussian curve, so that if the physics simulation around gravity is not perfect, the robot won't particularly care. Have you, have you had where, uh, an experience where you've done a simulation and then you take that particular model and uh, apply it to a real 3D arm? And what are the challenges of that? Have so that's that one-shot transfer that I was talking about, sorry. Yeah, so if you try and do it naively and just dump it on there, yeah. not as bad as you'd think, oddly. Okay. Um, so as long as you can make your image vaguely look right, so this is actually, I, I tried to be as generic as possible, it's taking an image that looks like this and the joint angles. Um, it will run vaguely well and kind of get the end of if you fiddle with the parameters a bit so that the simulation is happening over sort of a Monte Carlo simulation, it probably seems to go away. And you, you can transfer. Also means it's robust to that robot breaking because I've made it robust to all the joint parameters. Um, so 
other things. We're starting to um, get other robotics teams involved. So obviously we have been more involved in very large robots going around. They can be quite small and native vehicles, so we're getting um, spot moving coming over in June, and I'm hopefully going to get them to give it a try around the jet, and we can collect some samples from the outside. It's got a little face on it, I haven't spotted that. <laughs> um, so they also have one with an arm, so this allows you to go upstairs, and go in locations, and you can see it's actually got the arm. You've probably all seen some of the things in this video before. Um, but this allows us to go in human available spaces without having to worry about humans hitting them all melted. Things. So you could drop this into the Ita Taurus and hopefully... Yeah, so actually, I didn't think so, but the physicists seem to think that actually, it's got rubber feet, so they don't seem to think it would be able to break anything. Um, so this would just drive around and actually take a look. So one of the problems we have with Jet at the moment is that it takes about six months to sort of... Well, it takes about three months to plug in our robots and get them all in and working and then three months to take them out. So that's a big amount of time just to sort of install them. So you just chuck this through a window, <laughs> just hope it goes to the right location and get it out. But just a round jet as well, um, we have 1,100 ton doors that we have to open um, for you know, contamination. <laughs> so here's another sign of the robustness. This isn't actually using machine learning. This is actually using more traditional um, robotic techniques. You can see it's very robust to just get itself up and away. You even recognise it fell over. And it can change between routines and start climbing upstairs. You have a one-armed dog doing your household chores. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have a one-armed dog doing our nuclear robotics as well. So, <laughs> so you know with uh, these dogs, yeah. uh, they are obviously slightly AI-powered. So how these ones can actually be entirely autonomously driven. So how would would you give it, you would have to give it in different instructions to do? So yeah, I was giving a talk to the Office of Nuclear Regulations about mm, three weeks ago. They would very much want human to know the whole way around for the moment, please, thank you very much. Um, but realistically, <laughs> for issues like this. Um, <laughs> 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 Yeah, you can also run it human loop. Hydraulics. Oh, so I'm a software engineer, so I might struggle. But um, we have got some hydraulic bits and bobs. So one of the things about hydraulics in this area is we don't use them. Um, <coughs> nuclear robotics and hydraulics, we don't really mix as much as possible. Um, contaminated water is really hard to keep hold of because it keeps sort of washing out places. So the less water we have in any system or oil, any sort of liquid, we try and avoid. Um, this becomes really difficult when you make really big um, robots because hydraulics is generally the way you make really big robots. Um, so we have to come up with other ways. I'm going to slide over this because your last presentation was about Oxpotica maybe. We have projects um, with Oxpotica. They've gone around our sack because we have about 30 kilometers of safe fish row behind fences, but also still have students doing stupid things like jumping in front of cars. Um, yeah, so if you see these cars out on the road, those are actually being driven autonomously around. Um, so probably actually safer to jump out in front of those than other cars. Um, and as part of that, we're trying to leverage as much of this technology as possible, and I'll try and explain that a bit more, but we are setting up as part of race. Um, so at the moment we have a the building that you'll see in this animation in a second. We haven't got this cool bridge in at this point. <laughs> autonomous pit lanes. So autonomous car parking. There's underground charging park points. There's uh, rentable spaces if you want. Um, there's a control room, and they're going off onto the area around the back of our site where there's a number of different sort of ordinary road um, tasks. So this is an area where you can go before you want to deploy on the rest of the site that has humans on it, you can see there, um, and then before you start deploying towards Digcom. So the benefit of that is, not here, I'll move on. I'll, I'll come back to why we did that project. So Brain, we're part of a robotics AI and nuclear hub, so this was something that EPSA, UKRIs, um, funded for us for the next four years. We're involved with seven universities, Manchester, Bristol, um, Oxford, 
um, a few others. Uh, and essentially what we're trying to do is get some of these technologies that has been developed over the last 10 years in robotics out into the robotics, uh, into the nuclear industry. So we have Sellafield up north that needs cleaning up. That's a 117 billion pound project um, that we need to tidy up. And this is one of the ways that we're trying to tackle it. So at the University of Manchester, Barry Lennox, um, that we work with, you can see we have very simple um, husties sort of driving around the floor, just wheel vehicles, radiation scan on the front. And what you can do is set them off to scan your environment. So um, taking simple A star to do your path planning, but then also setting it to do a grid. You can see no radiation on the floor in green. Traverse the entire area of you. So the way they do this at the moment is with a human with a wheel a vehicle just moving forward. But as you come into, let's show that video, over the radiation sample that we put on the floor, big red dot, don't be humans there. So that's one way. Robots are starting to get deployed in these locations like AWE. Um, similarly, um, you can do your floating vehicles. So just a small submarine, low range location do a neutron sample, so this is the first time we believe that a neutron sample has been done with a robot. I think we're confident enough that it is definitely over the first one. We can come up with more. Hopefully go wrong. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. We can come up with more novel designs, so this is inside Fukushima. Uh, in um, Sellafield. One of the things about Sellafield, built in the 1950s, paper drawings, built by real engineers. Um, so the drawings don't look like how we, they actually are. Things got changed over the years as they got improved. We then shut the door for about 20 years because if you're active, you don't want to get here. Um, so now we have to recharacterize it. If you have a very small space, you have to get your robots in through pipes. Um, so this is a robot, like a transformer style robot. You drive along. Honestly, it has a rope on it, so you pull it back and you lose it. But it transforms. The simple solution is how it And then it will turn into this little robot you can see on the right, and it's got a LiDAR scanner which is creating this point cloud over here. It just, as you can see, creates point clouds. You know the image on the back is that underwater? No, so this is actually just a strange set of colours. This is in Centerfield, one of the process plants, A, I think, or building 27. Um, so it's just that one had a colour scheme, and this one had a blue scheme. I don't know why it looks quite so funny. Um, it does look like it's underwater. Some of the things about the floating. Some of these things are underwater, so that's why these things exist. Um, we, again, we try and keep water out of the way. Um, and again, can you get robots to go into hazardous areas? And so this one is recognizing if it drives over something nasty, please don't drag your tracks everywhere, wipe your feet on something. Um, so that was done in AWE by Bristol. So let's move back onto Jet for a second. As I was saying, um, this is VR for robots. So we had this in 1990, oh, 2001. We had a very um, line angle one before this, that brilliantly retro <coughs> and did the job amazingly. But obviously, we're trying to update this. But everything that um, we do, we have a live digital twin, as they call it now, or just VR, as we used to call it. Um, so this robot was live with what was happening in the real world. And that dark green, that ghost that you can see here, you might be able to see it this night, is where we want the robot to go, and that's where the robot is. So you can see this little try and get the robot into this location. Other things that we're starting to think about are, ooh, on, both videos. Collaborative design reviews. So you can see we're going through an upgrade process at the moment for the master system, that master slave device. And so if you're working across boundaries or you're working on massive devices where you can't go, working on a 2D CAD machine actually can be very difficult. So we've been working on collaborative design tools to allow you to start you know, taking things apart, investigating them. But these are CAD level quality devices. So this is done with the headsets. And I'm sure you've seen something of before. And this allows you to all get involved and get um, sort of down and dirty and sort of 
grab individual tiles, everything's labeled. You can just uh, gain engineering level quality out of things by just sort of um, clicking the right click button. I don't think I'd do this. Similarly, you can do it with quite large. Um, I apologize for the color scheme. That is not how Jet looks. That's how I kind of imagine Jet would look if uh, you had a brighter color scheme. Um, so you can get involved. You can jump about in real life. Let's try the next. Do these ones a slightly more realistic in color. What's the usage time on this? Because do you not kind of run into this issue of um, motion sickness? No, no, no. I've worn this thing for about eight hours, actually. Um, it got a bit heavy on my head and a bit sweaty. But um, to be honest, the way that I found that most people react to it better is if you don't try to immerse them, if you make it small or make it feel like a model, it becomes very realistic very quickly. There's a degree of getting it settled on your face, but actually having put two, three hundred people who've never put VR headsets on before, I haven't actually had anyone feel ill. It's not like a game where they're sort of flying you through the sky and you feel motion sick because you would if you were actually in the roller coaster. This is a slow in interactive event where you're sort of, it may look very jerky, but that's because I'm overexcited in VR. That's a bit of my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you move around slowly. If you lean down, you can get involved. And the benefit of this is that we can deploy this um, with multiplayer, essentially, and we can have people in South Korea, and we can point at the thing and make them look at it. And on a CAD screen over Skype, that's really, really difficult. Other things, benefits, it's really, really obvious um, that your component won't fit if you actually try and put it in, and it doesn't fit in this way. Other things that we struggle with is scale, as I was saying before. It's all well and good designing a device, your diagnostics pub, on a, on a screen that's 2D, but you forget that, first of all, someone's going to have to build this thing and lift it around, and it's the size of a, three, of a big cathedral. Um, and it's actually probably not reasonable to make some of these things, and seeing it in 3D makes that come a lot clearer. Other things you can start doing is overlaying um, sort of augmented reality. This is probably close to the mixed reality. So you can start putting your radiation doses over the top. So you can sort of do that. Second video as well. Beyond this, you can rather than still in this collaborative design review, you can start pushing it into your operation management system. So this is augmented augmented reality. Come on. It's just a picture now. Yeah, it's just a picture. Well, um, so yeah, what you could do is feed the information from the last ones directly onto a sort of HoloLens device so that they can feed this information. So we do still have, obviously, humans in the loop in this reactor, and we still send people in occasionally. Oh, here we go. Prepare the mouse page. Very slowly. And they can see operations. You can also see what the operators are doing inside. So you can see this is what they're meant to be doing. Um, and if we follow into here, got maps being overlaid to people. We've got live information about um, our cubicles. Um, oh, it's going down the cubicle. You've been told where to go. You show warning information. This is all over the top, but it gives you an idea of the type of things that you could do. You could even sort of use this to indicate dose levels, so don't go in these areas. There's a certain level of um, machine interaction that you have to start doing with this as well to not scare people if you're showing radiation. <laughs> yeah, you've got scan information so you can get your experts. So one of the things that you're going to start dealing with in um, other challenging environments as well, like uh, wind plants, is that it's very, very expensive to spend your specialist, send your specialist engineers from Copenhagen around the world. If you can send your general engineers and have them just see what you're looking at in 3D, it's a lot, lot cheaper. So that's what a lot of companies like Siemens and Rolls-Royce are doing now. Um, other things, you can give overlays within your <coughs> reactor to show that is where you're meant to be going. Um, this is entirely mock up for fujitism. We've actually got a PhD doing this at the moment. Um, but actually, the technology is surprisingly plausible because we know we have 
30 years worth of CAD, we know where everything is, we're having feedback information, so this is meant to be indicating the level of tightness that you're doing to say locked, uh, so you don't over tighten your bolts. Um, yeah, okay, so back to why we're interested in autonomous cars. So, um, Ox Oscar have two LIDARs, uh, a pair of omnidirectional cameras, stereo camera, and a box. That's essentially what's on top of all their cars. If you take that off, put it in a 3D plastic enclosure, what we can do is take the thing that they do at 30 miles an hour, put it in our reactor, and you can get out this sort of level of information as well. So we have our cars that we got over 30 years. We can scan this around in 20 minutes, it took us, and you can work out where um, your deviations are. So this is all remote hand equipment that we put in ourselves, the sort of red areas, and this was a light fixture that wasn't in the pad. So this allows us to do surveying very quickly um, with sort of iterative process to point uh, processes, very simple sort of stuff. But if you go slower, you can go from 70 miles an hour to 100 meters a second. So, other things you can start doing. Um, you can start using these VR devices to, you can see Barry, one of my apprentices, a glove, hat device, you can see in the um, VR it matches, but also you can get it in the robot as well. And so you can pick up ducts. If you replace ducts with nuclear reactors, you get the idea. And that's what's going on over here. <laughs> Ozan is um, actually controlling a pair of KUKA lightweight arms to do uh, a decommissioning style task. So rather than having to put your hands into a glove box, you know, sort of lead line gloves, you can actually get a robot to do it. Says. So he's moving around a simulated plutonium can um, very cheaply and effectively. Um, it's also worth noting that. Uh, the UK had been trying to do this project in the 1990s and got very, very close. And privatisation kind of put a kibosh to that, so it's very interesting that we're back to doing it again. Um, but we're in the process of um, finalising demonstrations in the RAIN project so that this can be deployed. Other things that are involved are we are delivering the world's largest wilderness hot cell. So that's you know, an area of radiation is. For the European Information Source in Lund, this is essentially a large uh, metal device like ISIS or Diamond. Well, I don't more like ISIS. Um, so we are dealing with all of the um, decommissioning elements, as it were. So they have this plug here that actually takes the neutrons from, the, from their source and everything gets logged into here. Um, so this is actually very radioactive into here, 100 giga, uh, 100 grays per hour. Um, and this all has to be chopped up. So there's a large amount of robotics that's going on here. So 2021, 20, we are delivering this. Um, oh, this is quite a slow video, so that will be time. Yeah, yeah. We have plugged area. So we we'll jump in a bit. Can you let me do it now? It's just going to pause. Um, we have autonomous cranes. We have wrap our cameras that are all being moved around. We have stuff being loaded into pits and taken out. All these have to be sort of remotely done. Um, there is going to be no autonomy in this section at all because we are delivering this for use in 2019 uh, through a base budget. We have to just get this done. Um, but you can see there's a lot of complex tasks going on there. Um, some of the more interesting IT aspects, as I was asked to do an IT talk rather than just show you videos of CAD. Uh, we're going to virtualize all of our server infrastructure and all of our control systems. So we have VMs for um, some of the hardware that is quite bespoke. Yes, KVM, we've got Seth doing this um, storage and we're using Proxmox for the management. But containers, oh, for our control system so that I can actually force our control system developers to have a clean box every day so it works on my machine is no longer an excuse. I love it. 
mm. being clients because we have very small rooms. Um, so as I was mentioning before, some of the, there are some absolutely massive technological issues still in demo that we need to solve. And one of them is this exact notion. So we have a five ton robotic arm, and these are lead screws, unfortunately not hydraulic. Um, and we have these blankets, these are around about 80 tons empty, they are filled with 120 tons of liquid lithium lead. The li uh, liquid lithium lead melts at around about 200 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, the radiation in these things cause them to radiate like a black body at about 200 degrees. So as soon as we start taking them out, it starts melting and starts wobbling. Um, this makes it really, really cool because you're controlling a big wobbly banana, a very small robot. Um, so it's under active position. Um, we do have 30 years to solve this, or this process. Uh, we shouldn't be doing this, but it does mean a really interesting control problem. So we have limited sensing on board, um, and we have a project at the moment called the Adaptive Positional Control System that we are utilizing this robot. Is there any way you can uh, uh, simulate this wobbly arm beforehand in some sort of simulation so that you train? Yeah, so we have um, an adaptive... Oh, yeah. um, we have uh, simulations being developed, but to a degree, we are pushing... So we're having to use continuum mechanics for that as well because finite element analysis isn't quite enough because the amount of deformation we're getting out of the joints and the gearboxes. Um, so we also wanted to understand this in reality. So we had a robot called Tarn that we used to use around the outside jet to reach things. We never had to use it because it wasn't radioactive enough. So we ended up using uh, it for this. So we refurbished it, we took out every joint, all the motors, changed the control systems out, um, all the electronics, and we put iron views, um, you can see icon systems, you can see people looking through windows, what's happening. Um, there are LIDARs, 3D LIDAR stereo cameras, um, every sort of sensor I can really kind of imagine so that we can monitor this thing, so that we can try and characterize what's going on when you start moving objects this large. The next half is building um, Mount Center Calvin filter style control system to F do a pose estimation of where it believes this robot is, given that every joint and every link is flexible. Um, so you might be able to see it in a second. It bounces more than you'd think. So when this stops, it bounces by about 10 centimeters. And that's just because of backlash in gearboxes and flexibility in the actual metal. It's really heavy. So one of the next things that we're going to do is put a big pendulum on the end of it um, and see if we can control that. And then we'll put a big blanket on the end of it or a big wobbly banana on the end of it and see if we can control that. So that's a really interesting project and I was on it for about two years before moving on to deep reinforcement learning. But I'll also be trying to control this with deep reinforcement learning. But we are trying more traditional control theory techniques as well. And with uh, deep reinforcement learning, is it still difficult in terms of you know, the, getting that wobbly message? Yeah, so... I like to describe this as sort of, um, there's an underlying parameter space that you can't actually measure. So the um, measurements are sort of the wrong end of the gearbox. So you don't know how much it's flexing by. So you're having to approximate what the robot state is and then try and control for it in a rapid time. There's also, because of the location, this is entering into the two kilograms per hour. We can't really see the thing it's holding and it's holding liquid. And we haven't solved the Navier-Stokes equations yet, unfortunately. So trying to control it is quite difficult. There is, as this is pre-concept design, there is flex. We are trying to prove whether this is possible or whether there are cheaper things that we could do. On more practical things, for Shingo Daiichi, um, so I, I'm sure you all um, saw the footage, um, obviously devastating. To a degree, uh, even though it was a failure, it was a reactor that was 40 years old, that was swamped by conditions it was never expected to, and actually didn't end up with that much um, damage compared to something like a coal plant would have caused in theory. Um, but we still need to go in and clean it. So taking the idea of the booms that we have, um, a spin-out company from us, Optic Technologies, that has now been bought out by VNS, Veolia Nuclear Solutions, has been tasked with building two 12 
15 meter long booms to reach in and do a lot of the robotic. So you may have seen some footage from um, Japanese, um, the TEPCO teams trying to enter. When they try and, let's go into the video. Be more interesting. No one will sell this. So we have a really long robot arm. We're going to send a camera in, very tight. And we, it's been covered in nuclear concrete, so there's no leakages. All the entry points have been covered. And we have these portholes that we go through. Um, this area here is actually very um, covered in just garbage and debris. So they have lost a robot already going into here. Um, I think they've lost a few, but they haven't said that. Um, and you enter into the environment. The first thing that they would like to do is do a 3D scan. The way that they've done this at the moment is that they built a robot that looks a bit like this and load it in our fishing rod down from the top. <laughs> Works incredibly well. Um, so this is actually all being mocked up in our work pool at the moment. So we have being built a off version, I think we'll maybe see or I can't remember, of this so that they can actually test some of these things. Um, other issues, um, we have on demo, two and a half thousand pipes that need to be cut in a space of two months um, and then rewelded to nuclear level quality. None of them are accessible from the outside because they're so tightly packed against each other. So you have to do it from the inside. Um, if we were going to do a cut with a sort of normal plasma cutting technique for a pipe this thick, it would take us about 30 minutes. Um, if you use the lasers, because lasers are really cool, it takes about three seconds. So what we actually have is a working do I have any videos? No, I don't have any videos. Um, a working device that we can send in from the inboard. It locates itself by pushing on the outside um, and then it fires a laser to cut and it also can then afterwards pull the two edges together and use a laser to weld. Um, and this takes us down from a 30 minute cut down to a three second cut. And you can do this all inside. So we are going through a project at the moment laser pinder um, for uh, getting into the inside. Does that mean that laser has to move very quickly because it's three seconds to? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. You can just dial in the laser, you can turn it down a bit, but we want to be quick. But it's just a single joint. Um, so we can actuate that very quickly. Other issues that we're deeply concerned about, so obviously at JET um, and ETA, there's going to be hundreds of robots working at JET we have two. ETA, there's going to be 70. Demo, there's going to be 700, I think was the number estimated at the moment. Um, all of these things are going to have to work for 50 years, be upgraded, have your latest Windows 10 update driver. <laughs> for the next 50. Yeah. Um, still, you're going to have to get your patches for your heart bleeds and your, you know. Um, also, they're going to have to talk to each other. And when new robots come along, when I'm all old and grey and someone has come up with something far better than I could, they're going to have to work in this system. This goes with oil and gas, this goes with huge, you know, so. so one of the projects we've been trying to push is a, um, a distributed control systems technology called Cortex. So this was something we did three years ago now, but it's kind of the best video I could find. Um, showing that you can get all these robots interacting, it's kind of like ROPs, if you know what that is, but suitable for industrial purposes, so quality of service, security taken in mind, um, authentication, authorization is a big part of it. Being able to actually integrate very smoothly into these happy devices, so getting real-time operations happening, um, building your VR, so this is a simulated task. This is a, this is a KUKA device being controlled. And the nice thing about this, it took us about three days to integrate um, that that little tiny pen that we bought for £1,500 into a KUKA and a gripper to be able to do this task. Um, and then you're taking maps from the drone, you're taking stereo pairs from the little rover to build out for you then to be able to control. Um, what are we doing with that? I burst over. So that's Cortex. Other projects we're getting involved is um, decommissioning, so Elephant Strats is one of them. We have a few of these projects. This is the one I lead, so I'm a bit more interested in. So, as I was saying, you have decommissioning project, you have 
um, some sort of process in part. But centre field, pipeworks, contaminated areas, um, all of that has to be cut up, put into boxes, stored, cleaned, and then you can start working on concrete around the outside. Um, traditionally, how you do this is that um, the door, you'll go in, you'll poke a broom through the door with a mirror on the end of it, kind of get an idea of what you want to do. You'll then send a robot in to have a look. They'll identify a pipe at the bottom that they're really interested in cutting. Um, they'll then put together a tender to have someone say how much it's going to cost. Someone will win that bid. They'll say we'll do it with all the robots we can imagine. They'll build something called the elephant, which will be uh, sort of four of these, two of these, or a track vehicle. It will be able to cut, it will be able to wipe clean everything. It will do everything that could possibly come against. Uh, they'll go through that, they'll build it, they'll go through prototype design. They will then um, take it to the safety case. That will take another two years. And then they'll get into the problem of it won't fit through the door, but it's really, really big, and they don't want to make the door bigger. So they'll send someone in in a rubber suit with a junior hat or in a bucket and cut the pipe. Um, if that is the most alarmed way of doing it. This project is trying to mitigate that, just making cheap robotic tools that we can deploy very quickly to do the job. They don't have to be perfect our hammer, not a screwdriver. You know, you're picking up things. So some of the things are just, again, we're seeing more robots picking up random pieces of objects here. Uh, you can see you can start doing waste handling projects. So uh, I'll take that move. The state would be um, investigating objects. This is a 30 degree, um, a 30 degree of free robot arm that we use for investigating in vessels and so on. Um, this is a simulated plutonium can. You can take it out, investigate it, clean it up, take it to pieces. Um, so this is a waste storage being made out of MPF, generally made out of metal. <laughs> um, but yeah, you you know you start yeah, sorting out. Hmm? You get more compliant. You. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, it really annoyed me when I was talking about this. And I did it for this video as well. You can see it's just there. Well, I can get one ordered. So maybe I'm going to buy some more. That was for. I can't remember what it was for. There's the camera joint. So the camera is filled with this. That's, that's what I got in the time box. I was really annoyed. It's on the camera. Well, they're supplying me with one. Yeah, well, this is kindly supplied from us from Sedfield. <laughs> it was sitting on someone's desk, apparently, but it's, it's clean, oh, I have been told. No, it's <laughs> it does just look like a furnace, though. Yeah, but we're looking into how you can handle these things effectively and cheaply. Yeah. Um, and then beyond this, we're starting to look at how we compare with sort of MNL um, and the Southwest Nuclear Hub to build this MNL. UF, which is our project, just to sort of deal with these engineers. And part of that is rapid deployment of these decommissioning elements. So we think that we can actually deploy these things in ISO containers. That big cell that you were looking at, you just wheel that up, jam it onto the side, and away you go. So Tom Scott team down in Bristol have done autonomous drones for uh, radiation mapping. Rocks have been doing autonomously, but they also use camera remotely control and can start chomping up things. So these essentially demolition of remotes. You can do, as I showed you earlier in the rain project, you can go around um, and survey your area. Um, so we're putting this up to be sort of accessible to um, uh, Thunderbirds, exactly. So you, you deploy your three robots, they sort of jam on. In this one, you've got your decontamination room. That one, you've got your plastic bagging machine. Um, but if you have a swish bit of technology like Createc with a gamma radiation camera that you can actually just look through it and you can see where it's coming from. Um, you don't have to build the rest of it. You can actually just come to us and we'll put your camera in here so that you can do your survey. So we can have rapid deployment. Okay, I have burst past my end time a little bit. But no one's complained yet. Do you collaborate with uh, DeepMind for any of your... I'm starting to, yeah. It's really fun. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so obviously in the deep reinforcement area, um, it's the way to go. There. So, uh, three years ago, four years ago, I thought machine learning for robots was quite niche, and then I saw, and uh, I'd been quite rude about it, and I saw DeepMind um, show some videos, and I had to just change my mind and set it up and start researching it myself, because it's the future, unfortunately, or fortunately. You sound so distraught. Yeah. <laughs> well, it just turns out that the, like, we got 
really, really lucky um, from a machine learning point of view that optimization techniques actually work and compute, you know, there's no um, uh, minima all over the place. You actually, if you go to high dimensional spaces like that one, you optimize very, very quickly to real things. And there was no reason to believe that would happen. So, uh, you know, we could all have to thank Jeffrey Hinton for the future that we are going to be stuck in. Um, You've got a lot of new monopolies. You've mentioned the enforcement. Mm. Um, how about supervised machine learning? Do you think you don't have a lot of obvious events to get anything decent, but you see that the new element might go from these things eventually as experts? It might be a long time before human being is out of the equation. Yeah, so I think it's more that we'll slowly just. So, uh, for this robot, it's 30 humans per robot. Mm. If we can get that down to five mm. per robot and then five robots per human, mm. um, it's obvious for, mo for the bad situations or the off normal situations, or just from an ethics point of view, we actually really want a human in control of this thing. Mm. Um, yeah, going um, but we can start moving our way towards it. So. Part of the game that's going to be from um, researchers is managing expectations to some degree and building a shared common language with plant regulators, or nuclear regulators, to understand that I don't really want to put autonomous human-like robots in here. Um, I want to do very, very individual tasks like a PD loop, A star, things that we already do in there just a bit cleverer. It's still just doing a mathematical equation that you aren't prompting and we have verified it. But you're going forward. It's going to be hard and take time, but if we start 30 years in advance like now, we will probably have an autonomous system in nuclear plant by the time we need it. So that's why we are starting a lot of these projects now. It's going to take a while. I you think you're planning for commissioning about 2050. Um, uh, and we learned from a a recent speak of a singularity when the robots take over is <laughs> most likely to be 2040. Uh, also, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> um, so, that's a good question. Fusion is um, very safe. So, you actually have to put a load of energy in to get it to do anything. So, to get it up to 150 million degrees, you have to put a load of energy in. Um, if you turn it off, it disappears in microseconds. And so the, there's no cascade events, there is no, you know, the, the core goes out of control. If anything goes wrong, you turn off the machine and it just disappears. Or if anything goes wrong, it breaks the machine and it just disappears into helium and everyone gets squeaky voices for a while. Um, yeah. yeah. See, I couldn't resist. <laughs> the issue comes more in um, making these things are stored well. Earthquakes are a big issue, so beta, Kalarash, as a um, seismic event two every 100 years. Um, so we would expect serious operational events that we would have to cope with within the plant's lifetime, um, and we have to design around those. But that's why we've started sort of 30 years in advance. We, we see this as being the safe, safest form of energy reduction over wind energy and all these others. And solar. And solar, yeah. So there's a lot of output from solar put, you know, production that's not pleasant. And also you have to send humans out to clean them. We can send robots. Yeah. What's the balance between academic interest and commercial interest? Yeah, so we're in a really, really quite interesting. We're in a really interesting space as well. So um, you, you saw there that we have industrial partners with we also have industrial um, clients where we're delivering. So that's about 50% of the business, and the other 50% is direct research engagement. So what Rob Buckingham, our director, is trying to do is bridge that tier of, excuse me, for the technology readiness from one, two, three, the sort of prototypes, and get them out of the industry to sort of be that Innovate UK step and take this risky step that we need for fusion. Um, that's mean we get to do really cool projects as well. So I get to write papers in the morning and play with robots in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> What well, do you do to protect your electronics from the high radiation, or do you just have them disposable? Um, so, originally we would just put them really far away, 
So we, we literally, so for the motor controllers, um, they are 50 meters away in the box outside the room and we just run wires. There are big issues with that with um, EMC and the cables and actually just getting the voltage high enough. Sensing can be a challenge. Also for wire grates, it's a challenge. Um, fiber optic is another option. Um, because you can just get more data down there and you can use more data, those are, don't be great. Um, you can also, rather than printing on silicon your chips, you can print them on ruby or diamond. Um, and those are semiconductors that have a bigger step, so you have to have a higher amount of gamma actually hit it to do the step up. Um, there's a company called Magic that has some good technology. So we are getting really close to actually having fully rad hard um, capabilities. Is it, practical, is it practical to do shielding? So Maybe some things go into lead boxes, but your lead box get big and heavy very quickly, and then if it breaks, you have to send someone in to get it, um, which is quite difficult. I think we have to wrap up now. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for a very uh, ambitious and uh, very interesting <laughs> talk. And uh, so uh, I hope we come away from this uh, talk and, uh, uh, with a view on what advanced things will happen in this place. So we're hiring, by the way. We've got <laughs> 50, 60 positions out with Brad to senior level. We hire anyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we're obviously looking for the higher, you know, the better than the brilliant, but I'm sure there's room still for it. We've got all sorts of so. baby young, <laughs> it's a very good <laughs> spread. <laughs> um, but anyhow, thank you very much.